If you had to travel through a hostile terrain to reach an unknown safe haven, what would you do? You'll have to escort a kid with an insane power and you have to be able to deliver him to a destination that you don't know where it is and you're not even sure if it even exists. And you're gonna have to protect yourself and him against cannibals, flesh-eating monsters, and horrific plot twists. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the Heaven Fortress in Heavenly Delusion. This girl is going to watch all of her friends get brutally slaughtered by flesh-eating man-eaters. Kiruko here is a deadly bounty hunter, and she's been assigned to escort this kid Maru, and she takes him to an unknown location through a hostile world, looking for a mysterious place called heaven, and neither of them know what it looks like or where it is. Stumbling across this abandoned town, they look for supplies, and Maru starts complaining that they have no leads, and they don't even know where heaven is, but Kiruko tells him to stop acting like a child. Entering this house, they see two dried up corpses in bed holding hands, oh how cute. But Kiruko then realizes that if people died in their homes, there isn't going to be any food left to find. Using the last bit of her own rations, they eat and make camp. Maru then catches her looking at an old photo of two men. She nervously then reveals that the young man in the picture is her old friend Robin, and the other one is a doctor, who she hopes to find while helping Maru reach his destination, killing two birds with one stone kind of thing. They sleep it off, hiding away from the horrors of this world that will soon find them. The next day, they decide to look for settlement to ask around about their mysterious heaven because they are lost, but they encounter some rather hungry thugs. Hungry in the worst way possible. They ask these two to hand over all their weapons and dignity, trying to make them lose interest. Maru says he's a guy, but so does Kiruko, and it's rather strange. And the bandits think she is insulting their intelligence. And then this one guy tries to threaten them, but Kiruko takes out this strange gun, scaring them. And this one bandit pulls out his binoculars and thinks she's actually holding a toy gun. Out of options, Kiruko makes Maru try and escape, but the bandits quickly overwhelm them. Okay, this is crazy, because we're in a messed up situation, but if I was them, we could have avoided this whole thing by just relying on the same logic that the ancient Egyptians used in order to sustain life. Let me explain. The world is an apocalyptic wasteland, and flesh-eating monsters of unknown origins rule the earth. And these two? They're trying to search for a mysterious place in the middle of nowhere and a place that they don't even know where it is. But if this is the case, it makes no sense why they were traveling so carefree when they should have prioritized looking for supplies first. Because why would you look for a place that you don't know where it is? You don't know which direction to go, which means you're going to burn a whole lot more energy, a lot more calories, a lot more resources trying to get there, especially since you don't know where it is. And why would you try to fight bandits? that were just a side quest. If I was them, I would have planned better and would have looked to gather certain supplies first that would have made my life a whole heck of a lot easier. It would have given me way more return on my investment, especially since the journey could have taken a long time. We need to look for understated things, things that might not necessarily look like they have a lot of value, but they're really worth a lot. Things like bleach, which will help disinfect injuries, rope, and airtight containers in order to be able to store food. That's important. Those would have been the first things on my grocery list. That being said though, while while we are looking for food. Also, while it would be ideal to go to a grocery store and just swipe the food, we are in the apocalypse. Not like you have to pay for everything all the time. That being said though, it has been years since the apocalypse happened, meaning that grocery stores probably have already been picked clean. And because of this, we might as well be prepared as hell to make whatever food we find last. Asking people for direction was already risky, but if we had to, in order to find locations of the settlement, would have most likely gathered around, and instead, I would have looked for areas of rivers that potentially carried fresh water, and ideally hopefully non-radioactive fish. Where there is water, there is life. And approaching their mission in this regard, it would have been way smarter and would have helped prevent them from spending unnecessary energy looking for food and you probably would have had to buy it or worse, steal it or kill someone for it. You're two kids. You're not invincible. But Maru acts fast and busts out some really cool moves, showing everyone and Kiruko that he's combat capable. But she quickly gets tired of them wasting time and Kiruko finally fires a gun and blasts a huge laser right at them, melting this pole and scaring the shit out of everyone. The bandits then surrender and these two force them to take them to their hideout. So they can resupply and to charge Kiruko's battery. There, they ask them if they know of a location called Heaven or a place like one. And wouldn't you know it, this one bandit then comes in and tells them that he knows about a tomato farm nearby. Bear with me, it's a place that houses a peaceful community and they could maybe try to find their Heaven there. Getting their battery back, Kiruko inserts it into her gun and thanks the bandits for charging her empty weapon, stunning them because they realize they just got played so bad. They count that they have four shots left to help them until they reach 
heaven, but elsewhere though, deep underground in a mysterious location, this facility houses these genetically modified kids. One, kids who have never seen the outside world and who have all sorts of strange and weird powers, run by this old lady known as the director. She trains these kids for an upcoming event, one that they have no idea will turn the world into a rather horrifying place. They're getting ready for the apocalypse. Completely unaware and naive as hell as to what is really going on, they go about another regular day when this one girl, Mahima, tells her friend that they will have a test today because she can sense it. Because she is special and feels things that no one else can see. Her friend Tokyo thinks that she's talking shit, just as their robot teacher reveals that they have a surprise test. The kids get ready to take it, but Tokyo's tablet suddenly glitches and another question suddenly appears on their page, asking her if she wants to go outside. It's weird, but she doesn't think much of it. After though, she talks about her experience with the others. And they've grown tired of living inside of this unknown location for who knows how long at this point for unknown reasons. And they begin to wonder what's outside their walled home. Mihime then reveals to them a secret. She has begun to have visions and dreams of the outside world. And two people come to rescue her from the other side. People that she's never met. And one of them looks like Tokyo, which freaks her out. Later, she goes for a walk and thinks about what Mihime said, but then runs into the direction director of the facility. This old lady, nervous, she asks her if there is an outside world, and her question shocks the director's assistant. But she confirms it, and tells Tokyo that the world outside is full of terrifying monsters that crawl the earth looking for human flesh. Back to Kiruko and Maru, she gets tired of walking and wants to rest. They then stop at this totally innocent looking inn run by this divided face lady. She gives them a super cheap hotel rate to get them to stay. Kiruko then shows her pictures of the two people she's looking for. For, but the lady says she's never seen them. They then clean themselves up and have dinner and make small talk. Kiruko tells the inn owner that she's escorting Maru as his bodyguard from Tokyo. And just then, Kiruko spots a gun nearby and divided face lady reassures her that at night, horrifying creatures known as man-eaters come out around here. They need to stay indoors for their own protection. Excited, Kiruko tells divided face lady that she can help her kill it, making her nervous. But she tells Kiruko oh, not to worry because it's unkillable and tells them that everything is totally under control. That night, Kiruko notices that Maru passes out quickly, which she's never done before, and it's really weird, but that's when she feels herself getting really sleepy, and she falls unconscious. Later, she wakes up with a start and realizes that they've been drugged. Hearing a terrifying scream outside, she quickly wakes up Maru and picks up her Kirubim, and they head out to investigate. They run into the owner, but she tells them to go back inside immediately, just as this horrifying man-eater lands right behind her. Alright, great, so now this woman is in cahoots with the flesh-eating monster, gosh. We could have figured all of this out way in advance due to the price of the hotel. This woman's amazingly suspicious too and the domestication of the wild animals. Let me explain. We don't know what man-eaters are. We just know that killing them is hard. However, if there were signs that everything was suspicious to begin with, it probably is. Look, it's noted that when Kiriko paid for the hotel, she commented how cheap it really was. And that's super unlikely in a post-apocalyptic world. Is a hotel food going to be that cheap? Just saying. It's not like there's a whole lot of excess resources lying around. Also, at dinner, the lady cooked them a full-on stew, and if we think about the current ruthless climate of this place, in times like these, they should apply the age-old saying, if something's too good to be true, it probably is. And in this case, the only way she could have fed these two was by already feeding them the last traveler. The only way she would have knowingly had knowledge of a man-eater being in the area was as if she ran into one at some point. And if this happened, it's unlikely that she would have been spared, unless it early on saw the woman as some sort of easy source of food. Don't quite understand the intelligence level of these man-eaters, but we we can assume that upon first meeting this woman, you can tell that the woman housed other humans regularly and could have quickly learned that this place was a hot spot for a free lunch. The man eater from the beginning, upon meeting this woman, could have realized that, hey, this is a free meal. The woman still being alive means that she likely capitalized on this advantage of hers by killing her guests and possibly saved her own skin and started feeding her guests to the man eater in the area in exchange to not be killed herself. So in short, always be careful of what you eat. Always be careful of older people in general. Start Startled, Kiruko tries to shoot it, but the monster deflects her shot. Then they note that this creature has a defense tail, and it can move at lightning quick speeds, and it attacks them in a flash, forcing Kiruko and Maru to run for their lives and hide behind this little hill. They quickly discuss the game plan to kill this beast. Maru says he spotted
added three whips on each arm. But that's when it spots them and charges at them. Kiruko reacts and fires a shot, blasting one arm away. Maru lures it to him, and Kiruko aims for another hit. But Divided Face Lady stops her, and she reveals that the monster is her son. He was eaten by this creature, and now believes this man-eater is her son. And you want to know why? Man-eaters absorb the memories of their prey. Kiruko tries to reason with her, telling her that she lost someone to a man-eater too once. These things are dangerous and have no soul, and her son is truly dead. Divided Face Lady tells Kiruko that she's wrong and tries to convince them. Now out of bullets for her Kirubim, they give in. The hotel owner tells these two that it's perfectly safe. Just as Divided Face Lady gets her face brutally divided in half, shocking these two, Kiruko reacts quickly and tells Maru that the whip went in one direction and there was a pause between the first and the second attack, which means there is a delay between attacks. Maru charges at the monster, quickly dodging. He swoops in right in front of it and pushes his hand onto his chest. Using his powers, he squeezes its heart. The two then continue on with their journey. Crossing this river, they soon reach this tomato heaven farm. Maru's unsure what heaven is supposed to look like, but he finally ends up telling Kiruko the truth of why she got hired to escort him and tells her his true mission. He was told that he needs to find someone that looks like him and inject this medicine straight into this person when she finds him. He doesn't know what this medicine does, and he doesn't even know what this person looks like, just that they will find him in some place called heaven. He then asks Kiruko if his guardian Mikura said anything to him about this mission before she died, but she says that she was only told to take him to heaven and gave her a weapon that she now has before she died. And that's when these town folk from this tomato town walk over to them, suspicious. Kiruko asks them, they're looking for a place called heaven. The town folk assume she's talking about this place, since, well, it is heaven for them. They take them in, but the two quickly realize that no one here looks like Maru, which means that this place is not heaven. And then they notice a package nearby, and Maru says it has the same symbol as Kuruko's Kirubim that Mikura gave her. They then ask this local, where did this box come from? And they say all their packages come from Tokyo. Kiruko realizes that if they look into this logo, they might just find some sort of connection to Maru's mission and where this gun came from because it's high tech, well beyond anything that is available around here. They ask this local if there's any other place around that could resemble heaven. The local tells them that some years back, there was this place called Asakusa that used to be known by everyone as heaven. All right now they have a new plan. They decide to head back to Tokyo by boat to find where this logo comes from and its connection to Maru because this could lead them to the real heaven. Taking the boat, Maru reveals his love to Kiroko like a stupid teenage boy, and then he tries to plant a big one right on her mouthpiece. But Kiroko then tells him something big, and says that while she has the body of a woman, she's actually a man. Huh? Maru's kind of confused. Clearing up the confusion, she tells him her whole wild backstory. Basically five years ago, this kid named Hiruki was the brother of a famous kart racer in Tokyo, and they were friends with some orphans, the man in the picture and this doctor. But one day Hiruki got half eaten by a man eater, and his sister tried to save him, but it was too late. He later woke up in the hospital, but realized that his brain was transplanted into his sister's body, who donated her body to save him. Recovering, Hiruki, now in his sister's body, finds out that all her friends disappeared from town, and so did the doctor who performed the surgery, now stranded. Hiruki was forced to take odd jobs, and that's how she got requested to become Maru's bodyguard, and she reveals that she is Hiruki inside his sister's body. At this point, Maru doesn't know what to think, but she tells Maru just to call her Kiruko. He then asks her if her orphan friend is the guy in the pick from earlier, and she confirms it by saying his name is Robin, her childhood friend. Suddenly a scream is heard nearby, and one of the passengers says their ship is being attacked by this monster in the water. Back to the facility with Tokyo, the kid begins asking other students if they know more about what's outside, and this one wheelchair kid named Taro says that one of the air vents could lead outside, but he suddenly starts to feel sick, covering his diseased marks on his hand. Tokyo tries to help, but Taro quickly leaves. She then walks past these two kids doing something with their lips that she's never seen before. Before, and she tries to figure out how many cameras are in this facility. Meeting up with her close friend Cuckoo, she tells Tokyo that she wants to show her something and helps her sneak into this vent when no one is watching. And the control room meanwhile doesn't notice them as they watch over the children but start to notice them displaying behaviors that they were never taught, like being reckless or kissing each other back in the vents. Cuckoo leads Tokyo down into this private room and shows her these horrifying alien babies without faces, shocking Tokyo. And that's when the alarm in the room goes off. Cuckoo quickly escapes back into the vent, helping out a struggling Tokyo, and she leaves a footprint mark trying to climb up, and the two escape. And this strange
strange baby then starts voicing the word Tokyo. In the control room, guards and the scientists alert director Old Lady about the alarm, but they mention that no cameras have been able to locate any intruder. They scrub through all the footage but don't see anyone. The director then heads to their facilities, AI system called Mina, and asks it for help, but also says that the alarm must have been a glitch. Back to Kiruko. She's fighting this monster in the water, and she reacts quickly and fires off a round, but soon realizes that she's out of bullets. Barricaded within the ship, the captain says they won't reach shore for another 30 minutes. Kiruko analyzes the mutant and says it's covering itself with a water bubble that acts as a lubricant and uses these hands to move across land. Finding a way to destroy the bubble might be the only way to kill it. Alright, look, I know things are bad right now, but listen, in order to survive, I'm going to rely on the innate hormonal desires of men, our feminine wiles, and the time it takes to deliver a hot pizza to your door. Otherwise, you get it for free. We're up against a man eater, but if this is the case, it doesn't make sense why Kiruko or Maru didn't know about this possible hazard before. I mean, like, they grew up in this world, you think you could put two and two together, unless they never took a freaking bone in their lives. Man eaters are present everywhere, which means it's not that hard to believe that there might be some in the water. They should have prepared for this, especially the professional sailors. And also, we're in a post apocalyptic world. Regular shipping routes, I'm sure, often get harassed by pirates. And even now, apparently, man eaters. And they're a very real and common threat, which means these sailors should have been prepared for such things. They should have had something, anything, even anti piracy fire hoses help. By utilizing high pressure stream of water, they'll be able to push a whole heck of a lot of things back. And some even come with semi automatic and remote control systems. The point is, is that these veteran sailors literally had no excuse and they had nothing that they could have used to defend themselves. And these sailors are so freaking lucky because the only thing that can kill these man eaters is Maru or the Kiru beam. And that is now out of ammo. And this means in order to survive, we have two options. We can either try and barricade ourselves more, more securely in this cabin until we reach land in 30 minutes, or we can try and kill this creature. We're going to leverage our powers against these sailors and take advantage of them and the time it takes to reach land. In this case, I would whip out my feminine charm as Kiriko and act like these sailors long lost girlfriend using our cuteness and adorableness to make them at least agree to run around the ship and distract the monster. If they say no to that deal, you could just threaten them with a gun and say, listen, we can kill these things and if you don't listen, we will all die. Either way, they will buy us time until we get closer to land and then we could get away scot-free. They figure out how to fight the man eater and need two things to kill it. A dry environment and a maze because they need to stop its quick straight line attacks. Kuruko drags Maru down to the basement of the ship and she prepares Maru to use his Maru touch. They get the monster's attention and run for their lives down these stairs below deck. Crossing these boxes, they make a final stand at the end. Maru says they can't escape through this door, but Kuruko says they don't need to as the man eater approaches them. And that's when the bubbles start evaporating and the fish quickly start drying up, making him realize there's weeds all around him, sucking up all the air here. Maru finally finishes the fish off with his touch, and they manage to save everyone. Reaching land, they find out from their crewmates about the area that they landed in. This guy tells them that if they head straight in that direction, they'll soon come across a small town. This guy then spots the bird logo on Kiruko's gun and says it's the Mitsuba Company logo. And their company is located on the way into town that they can follow. Following the direction of the sailors, they soon spot a bird on the wall of this building and realize that man must have mistaken their bird logo for this shitty drawn logo and really don't find anything worthwhile. So they decide to camp here and head to the town in the morning, back to Shiro underground. He receives a shocking image of his best friend, Mihime, horrifyingly excited. He questions why she sent it, but puts the pic to good use anyways. However, the next day though, he realizes that picture has disappeared and doesn't know who or what did this. He confronts Mihime about it and finds out that she never sent him anything. Not telling her what she sent, he confesses his real strange feelings to her. Primal feelings. But she can't understand what he's trying to say. Outside, Tokyo overhears them and runs away. Bumping into wheelchair kid Taro, she finds out that he's getting more sick. Whatever he has is killing him. He tries to kiss her, but Tokyo doesn't understand what he's trying to do and runs away. And then she runs into Kona and tells him that people are starting to act weird and do things with their bodies and mouths. But Kona tells her that he was one of the first kids raised in this place and says that everybody here is just experiencing normal human emotions, feeling comfortable. She tells Kona that she has a crush on this big stud and he says he likes her as well. Later that night, their happiness is cut short when everybody finds out that Taro's condition has gotten worse. Tokyo rushes to see him, but the doctors tell her that he won't get better getting close to him. He whispers to Tokyo, she 
should run away and tells her this place is dangerous, shocking her. Back to Kiruko and Maru. They finally reach the small town. Kiruko then goes to go get some supplies, while Maru gets into trouble again with some more random thugs, forcing the two to beat their ass and hide. Inside of this hotel, Maru reveals some more useless character backstory. He talks about how he came from a closed down orphanage years ago and got adopted into a fighting gang where he gained his sick move. Gosh, is it over yet? Anyways, he says at some point during this time, he met Mikura, who took him in and taught him how to do the Maru touch. He doesn't know why he can do it, but he knows Mikura was unable to do it, and she wanted him to go to heaven to use Maru touch there. But again, he doesn't know why. And he also doesn't remember which town Mikura discovered him in, and leaves everybody with a ton of questions. Kiruko then mentions that while she was out, she overheard some people talking about a group known as the Ministry of Reconstruction. According to the rumors, this group has started kidnapping people with valuable skills, and hope to rebuild society and fill it with key roles one day. Alright, look, while it might seem more like a gossip, the formation of a secret government is actually not that far off of an idea. And it actually makes sense if you think about statistics and the resilient mental health of humans and Kiefer Sutherland. Let me explain. The continuity of government, COG, it's the principle of establishing defined procedures that allow a government to continue its essential operations in the case of a catastrophic event, like nuclear war. And ever since the Cold War, many countries have developed such plans to avoid or minimize confusion and disorder due to a power vacuum in the aftermath of a nuclear attack. And unlike in the movie Book of Eli or Mad Max or many other post-apocalyptic movies that show the absence of a government being gone entirely, such a world happening is actually very unlikely due to the chain of command. At least in the US, for example. They have a designated survivor. Ah, you see what I did there? But it's actually a real thing. The president, if he croaks and kicks the bucket, there's 15 other people on a list that would have to also die in order for the government to be in a real problem. But even then, one person would be a designated survivor and would be taken away from the disaster event. And this also corroborates with the fact that even in such a situation such as this, a government of some kind would still exist. However, whether the government would convince people about, you know, following along with the new chain of command, that's, well, that's a whole other problem and a whole other story. Because having distrust with this, well, apparently, new government, even though it's not new, it is a change. And people don't like change sometimes, which means they might have a problem and a new faction could arise. And if we take into account the effects that war has on civilian mental health, studies from World War II, Iraq, and the Syrian War, and other similar events have actually been shown to decrease mental health issues like depression, anxiety, and even epilepsy, because according to studies, it's because of group togetherness. Basically, you're feeling useful, contributing to society or a group more and more and such, and getting social with people, which means that our species and its government are actually a lot more resilient than most people think, and it actually would likely try to do what Kiriko heard about doing, by doing whatever they can to try and rebuild society, as this would be their number one priority. Kiruko goes out to shop for supplies and finds a map of the area with markings of water purity levels, telling them how drinkable the water in each area is based on clarity and taste. And Maru spots a 100% water purity level in this one point on the map and thinks that's as good of a guess as any to where heaven could be. Because I don't know about you, but probably heaven has safe drinking water. The two then decide to check out the place next. But that's when they hear a loud bang on the door and find out it's one of the shipmates from the boat, Buzz Cut Guy. He says he tracked them down to ask if they can be hired to be his bodyguard because he's transporting precious cargo because he's going to the immortal order just like them because he heard there was a doctor there who can keep you alive forever. Kiruko's eyes bulge wide at this statement but he doesn't recognize the people in her picture and he shows them that he's carrying pieces of a man eater because the doctor at the immortal order can apparently graft man eater flesh onto human flesh and this is how someone can become immortal. He shows them his man eater but realizes the flesh has disintegrated and he begins crying not caring at all. Kiruko asks him for directions to the immortal order and then they decide to go stock up on fresh water first before going there. And that's a bad idea. But they don't know that. Heading to the location of fresh water, they bump into this hotel owner and they decide to drop their stuff off in one of her rooms and travel light in order to be able to get some water. Following the map, they come across this creepy underground shelter and head down inside. There they spot the water, but also this injured man. And in a broken, scared voice, he tells them that a monster just killed his friends and it's still here. Suddenly, this huge creature charges at them and forces them to run for their lives. Kiruko tries to take a shot with her Kiru beam but misses. She fires another shot at this pillar, crashing it into this monster and makes it pass out. Maru tries to rush in to kill it, but suddenly it wakes up right in front of them. Chasing him up this pillar, they catch their breath and realize that this creature wasn't a man-eater, but a bear. And that's why Maru's attack didn't work on it. Kiruko also clumsily drops her gun's battery down onto the floor, making them at this point complete idiots. They don't have any weapons and now they're helpless. She tells Maru to go get it, but he's scared. Kiruko then proposes that if he goes to collect the battery, she'll let him cop a feel. Now, of course, he's super motivated and he hauls his ass over, running down to get the battery and zips right back up before the bear nearby tears his face off. 
Now armed, deadly, and horny, apparently, Kiruko tells a love-struck Maru the new plan. Maru's going to jump down, catching Kiruko in his arms, and Kiruko tells Maru to run, just as the man-eating bear comes out of hiding and charges at Kiruko. She takes aim and prays, firing her last shot as she blasts the bear's head clean off. And then they celebrate for a hot second, then head back to the hotel room. But then they find out from the hotel owner that some man came and asked about the identities of the people that killed the bear, forcing Kiruko to remember something strange. They didn't find any drinking water at the location on the map, and instead ran into an obvious trap. And this means they got played by the people in this town, and they got lured into their hunting grounds. Meaning if they didn't escape, the bandits would have likely trapped them from the tunnel entrance. The man who sold her the map might have been in on the job too, making them now wonder what on the map is real and what is fake. Realizing they need to wait until the coast is clear, they decide to go get some shot eye. But Maru says, hey, they had a deal. Looking at her like a dog with a bone, Kiriko reluctantly agrees. She tries to make him feel weird about it, but Maru is one horny boy and says, too bad. And that's when the hotel owner busts in and tells them that she has a strict no nastiness policy and drags Maru out straight to her room. There she introduces herself as Totori. And she tells him that this hotel is actually one giant sex house and she mm -hmm, has picked her prey. She tries to get him to touch her chesticles, but Maru Maru's touch suddenly does something to her and he calls out to Kiruko. She busts in as he says that it went in, confusing her and making him super embarrassed. Back to the facility with the little kids. Underground, one of the scientists notices a footprint in this room, making him nervous. And he goes outside and tries to match the footprint to one of the kids' shoes because he thinks there's no way that they managed to sneak in here. Elsewhere, wheelchair kid Taro finally dies, making the entire school worried, especially the director. She warns her workers that this is the second death in this school. The first one kicked the bucket herself, and now this one died due to a mysterious disease. She wonders if having these children here is a mistake, and question how Taro got sick, since their bodies have been genetically modified to withstand all diseases, and she gets warned by her people that it's possible that other children could eventually get sick as well, because they don't know what's going on, what caused this in the first place, and she gets mad and orders them to fix it before it's too late. But later, she gets told that Taro's body has mysteriously disintegrated, leaving behind this strange black rock in its place, confusing everybody and making them more worried about what could happen next. Tokyo then begins to feel sick, worried. She heads on back to get checked, but gets told that she's fine, just tired, and she gets ordered to rest in her room. Here, she sees one of her old classmates' spirit, Asura, turned into this strange creature. Just as this doctor comes in to check on her, making her vision of Asura disappear. The same guy from earlier. He notices Tokyo's shoes and thinks that she could be the one who sneaked into the lab. All right, yes, this is a shit show, but this could have been all avoided if they just noticed this whole thing had been set up based on economic resources scarcity and good old common sense. Let me explain. Why would fresh drinking water be located where it was as this place would have made it super inconvenient for people to come to? And if we think about what type of water source was there, it's likely it could have been a well or a storable container. And if it was a well, well then it makes no sense why such a well would be down there in the first place. And if it was a storable drinking container, one that wasn't reliant on being built close to the earth, then it wouldn't have made sense to place it down in that location also. You could have just easily been placed above ground and more easy to reach. Also, the moment they entered the staircase and saw water on the floor, that should have been their second aha moment. If there was leaked water on the floor, then that would have already indicated to them, one, the fresh water in question would have had a leak and that's why the basement was flooded with the water. Two, the water spill wherever it came from likely contaminated the fresh water source, which is a higher probability if the water source was a well. And three, or that the water being here would have made the overall location of where this water source was located inaccessible as hell. Either of these three possibilities should have rang huge alarm bells in at least Kiriko's head at the moment they saw the water leak because she is a trained bodyguard designed to spot suspicious signs. Also, Kiriko didn't exactly even consider how she came to find that map in the first place. We have to remember that this is the apocalypse. What have posted Maru there at the entrance while I went down to explore, securing at least a clean getaway because that's super important. And this means that Kiriko failed at every single level. Elsewhere, Shiro goes to meet Mihime and sees her looking up at the ceiling. She points to what she's looking at, but Shiro can't see anything making her realize that she's the only one who can see it floating winged things. They then go to class, but that's when they realize that Tokyo isn't there. This robot tells them that she'll be gone for a while, and no one realizes that she's been abducted. Back to Kiruko and Maru. They apologize too to Tori, but she's chill about it and tells her her plan is to rent out hotel rooms in order to make more money and to sleep with all the customers and become the king of the hotels. Great. Later though, Maru wonders why he was able to enter Todori and humans in general, but they don't have time for answers. As they leave the next day to their final destination, destination, the Immortal Order. Reaching their territory, they quickly find out that they are out of money to travel, knowing that Maru is the only one capable of killing man-eaters. They set up a man-eater killing service, hoping to attract fresh customers and, well, cash. They've 
no idea that they are being watched. This scout in the distance goes to report to his boss, Dr. Usami. He tells his grunt to bring them to him immediately, back to Kiruko and Maru's location. Some other bandits approach them and say they might have a job for them, taking them to this rundown hospital. Kiruko tells them they have business with the Immortal Order, shows them a pic of her friend and her doctor, asking these people if they have seen them, but no one recognizes them, making Kiruko quickly realize that these people aren't the Immortal Order and that now the real Immortal Order is actually looking for them. But this group opposes the way of the Immortal Order, and they are known as Liviumin. Their leader introduces herself as Mizuhashi. They saw their man-eater sign and want them to help him on a mission. Mizuhashi shows them her fake leg and says that years ago, the Immortals promised to fix her sickness but instead amputated her leg. She thinks she was a part of Dr. Usami's horrifying experiments. A crazy doctor hell-bent on replacing people's bodies with machines. According to rumors before the collapse, they were already trying to replace people with machines. But after the world's end, they went crazy with their experiments. And she says there's something else going on in there. When she was in their facility, she discovered a body chopped up into pieces, barely clinging to life by machines. She approached it, but it asked her to kill it. Misuhashi suspects the Immortal Order is worshipping this machine-human hybrid, and they must stop them before Dr. Usami's barbaric ways take over the world. She asks them if they know about man-eater transplants, grafting parts of man-eaters onto human bodies, because apparently this is the sick shit the Immortal Order is up to, and this is why they're keeping a man-eater underneath their building headquarters. In order to stop them, they must kill their prized man-eater they are keeping down there, and they'll pay Kiruko and Maru to help them. Beyond convinced that Dr. Usami is connected to her horrifying past, Kiruko accepts the job, saying the doctor that she is looking for could be there as well, and maybe then she can finally get some answers. The Livumen group then lay out the game plan. Starting a rally the next day at the bad guy's headquarters, they'll distract him while Kiruku and Maru sneak into their basement, getting led in by one of Livumen's inside guys. Heading down this empty basement, they get ready to work. But just then, Kiruko sees something on this car. Approaching it, they think it's a man-eater and Maru destroys it. But then they spot another one, and then they realize that this place is crawling with these bastards. But that's when this monster sneaks up on them and quickly knocks out Maru before he can act and manages to overpower Kiruko holding her down. More man-eaters start to crawl all over her and begin to eat her alive while she screams in pure horror and they both die. I'm just kidding. Kiruko then gets woken up by Maru who says that she suddenly started hallucinating when she laid eyes on this man-eater. They think it has the power to create fake visions in their minds but then the creature dies randomly just as someone approaches them. It's Dr. Usami impressed at their power. He says he wants their help to help him kill someone close to him. Confusing these two and putting them on edge, they follow him inside the Immortal Order building to see what he wants and what's really going on inside. Upon walking inside, they see patients with prosthetic limbs being helped, and he leads them into this dark room and tells them he needs them to do what they did to the man-eater in the basement. And Maru just needs to do that of the human right there. Opening these curtains, they see what Mizuhashi reported seeing. This girl with all her limbs cut off. Dr. Usami says these machines are keeping her alive, but if she dies, she will turn into a man-eater, revealing that man-eaters are actually humans that are sick with a disease, and once they die, they morph. And he tells them that they tried saving this girl by amputating all of her infected tissue, but it's no use. Now, he can only slow down the disease from spreading, and he asks Kiruko and Maru if they can let this person now die with dignity. Maru analyzes her and says he can do it. They also confirm that this is what the woman here wants as they communicate to her with this tablet. They talk directly to her and she confirms it, and Maru suggests they move her outside to let her see the sky one last time. It's what the woman wants. So they get to work on moving her out. Meanwhile, the protest continues outside, and Mizuhashi suddenly gets hit in the head. They take her into this building, but then do something crazy. This guy lies to his people that their leader is dead, and that they must take revenge on the Immortal Order, and find out from their guard in the basement that Kiruko and Maru just killed the man eater, which means they can now attack and kill everybody inside. Hordes of Leva men break into the Immortal Building, killing this one dude and forcing Dr. Usami's helpless patients nearby to evacuate. Okay, look, this is where everything went south, and it's thanks thanks to these two, but if I was them, I would avoid it all of this, literally, by asking just a few simple questions. Let me explain. Kiriko here yet again proved to us that she was more useless than a whale in the desert. She trusted this group too willy-nilly and didn't even bother to vet their story before helping them out in the first place, because if I was her going along with such a cause that we didn't know zip zilch not about, not very good. I would have asked them what the exact purpose was of the immortal people in that building, and would have questioned why they let their leader go after taking her leg. If their sole purpose was to to experiment on people by using their body parts, then they would have likely taken more of her body, or 
or at the very least kept her locked up and or killed her so that way she wouldn't have told anyone or anybody or what was going on inside of that building and also by asking questions we could have also have figured out why she was able to casually see that cut up body because just a simple examination of the story starts to reveal some holes and would have at least informed these two that what they were participating in is actually very suspicious from the get-go meanwhile maru gets ready to kill this girl using his lethal touch upon touching her he sees her life force within her and gently and oh so sweetly puts her to sleep forever and sees the patient girl thanking them for letting her remain as a human in her last moments and thanks dr usami for donating one of his eyes to her upon seeing the message he begins to cry and dr usami meets his other patients who tell him that the levu men brook have broken in and he instructs them to head to a settlement nearby and he'll follow them after he buries this girl he confesses to kiriko and maru that he's not a doctor he was just really good at making prosthetics and over time word spread that he was helping people they give him space to mourn and wait downstairs there kiriko asks these people about her friend in the picture robin but this one guy says that the man in the photo looks like a doctor they know a man named dr inazaki he used to work here and studied under dr usami as the group then leaves for the other settlement a little while later they hear a gunshot and they discover that dr usami decided to stay with his own patient forever inspecting his now useless corpse they discover a button that he was holding with the same logo as the one on the kirubim and since they don't know where heaven is or where maru is meant to go they decided to track down where dr usami's logo came from so they decide to go to where it all began dr usami's town back in the immortal headquarters the liva men take it over and say they can now make a new world with all this high tech here not realizing that kirugu and maru missed one man eater in the basement and it just woke up the next day kirugu and maru are off looking for the doctor's town trying to follow where all of his patients went but suddenly they then encounter an earthquake making a building nearby them crash and they rush over to it hoping the people from the nearby town will come to collect it for resources but then they discover this weird dude already there they ask this headband guy juichi if they can ask him some questions but he says information isn't free they show him kiroko's pick of robin and the doctor and asks him if he knows what the word heaven means he then suspiciously gets back in his car and parks at this very specific spot he tells them he makes a living telling stories and he might know where the emblem means so hey they pay him and he talks and he says years ago he came across this school building run by many women there they captured him and kept him as a prisoner for 10 years along with any other man they captured forcing him and other men they kidnapped to become breeding pigs and he shows them his breeding pig tattoo number in short he diddled women on the daily and then he eventually fathered a son breeding pigs were supposed to raise the boys but one day him and the couple that gave birth to his son all tried to escape however he was the only one who managed to escape the two women died and the son remained at the school maru wants to go rescue the son but kiriko doesn't trust him she quickly figures out that his tattoo is fake and he's just trying to scam them they chase him away and kiriko says that she suspected he was hiding something behind his truck and they spot the same emblem from earlier on the wall they realize that the crest on the kiro beam is a school symbol and then they follow the sign to the school takahara academy reaching there they see boxes with the same symbol and even a bird symbol on the wall but the whole place looks deserted kiriko finds this letter from someone named the director in it they figure out that this academy has had many branches all over japan and was some kind of orphanage before the great disaster the letter describes the outside world as a hell making kiriko realize a huge clue she asks maru that the opposite of hell is heaven meaning this academy could be related to maru's destination about to head to the facility in ibaraki headband guy shows up again and begs them to help him on a side quest he shows them his tattoo is real proving that his story is true and they realize that his mission is in the same area as the heaven facility so they agreed to help him heading to ibaraki the disguise maru up as a woman while headband guy hides and these two women head to the facility seeing it's empty they then run into a crazy man eater with ice powers and they just barely managed to escape from it kiriko then thinks everyone here must have moved locations it means they could be anywhere they go back to tell headband guy the bad news just as they run into one of his old breeding pig buddies they tell him they have his kid and they take everyone to their little house and everybody reunites and it's all hunky dory and then later that night they start to feel super cold as everything around them starts turning into ice they realize that the man eater from earlier must have followed them and everywhere around them begins to turn into solid ice kiriko rescues everyone though and runs off to protect headband guy's son but ends up finding out that he is actually the man eater hiruko he then wakes up and all of his power stop it's insane and now that this useless side quest shit is over kiriko and maru leave the next day to go back on their main mission to find the facility back underground the director holds an emergency meeting and tells everyone
everyone that Tokyo has fallen pregnant. Shocking everybody, they never taught the kids how to be naughty. And they suspect the father is Kona, sending Tokyo to the med bay. The doctors help her give birth, just as Kona elsewhere senses the children being born. Later, this black-haired lady, Ayoshima, is then announced as the new assistant director of the facility. Shocking glasses guy over here since he was next in line. He then goes to complain to the old lady, but she says he's a part of a grand plan. Nervous? He complains to her and says that they still haven't figured out how this disease is slowly killing the children. Pissing her off, but also forcing her to reveal something horrifying. And something that glasses guy already suspected. She wants to use the children's brains as hosts, to put her own brain inside of them and basically live forever. In particular, Tokyo's children, since they are the freshest. Glasses guy warns her though that the children need to be at least 13 years old before they can do a transplant. But old lady tells him she's running out of time because, well, she's old. She then tells him her backup plan, and the reason why she promoted black hair lady, Ayoshima, as her second in command and not him. She will use her body to host her brain, and this way she will be able to still run the facility while she waits for Tokyo's children to grow up. <laughs> and then she'll switch bodies with them when they are ready. Glasses guy looks at her like she's crazy and tells her that this is not what he signed up for, but she doesn't care and orders him to watch over Tokyo's children no matter what. He then goes to meet up with Ayoshima. They both agree that they need to execute their plan as soon as possible because the director's plan is evil. Elsewhere, Bihime goes to chill out with her other friend, this girl with sunglasses named Ohama. But then she accidentally begins hallucinating with her powers, making her end up in the med bay. There, she sees Kona also there. He tells her that he's feeling weak because he's somehow synchronized with how Tokyo's pregnant body is feeling. She then confides in him that when she looks into people's eyes, she can see visions of the future, but not all the visions are real, making her sometimes see the worst and sees him as a horrifying monster. After feeling better, she sees Ohama come up and to apologize for what she did, but then she has another vision, this time of her being tied up and chopped up to pieces by these machines. But then somehow she goes through some serious character development in the span of 10 seconds and breaks free from her terrifying visions, assuring Ohama that they can't hurt anybody. The next day, all the kids are gathered and are told that they will now be put through their final test. Tokyo also shows up all healed to join them. Mina, the robot running the facility, tells them that this test will be long. They must try to reach the outside of this facility, because that is the role, as Hiruko's, and must do what they think the correct answer is, telling them that their test will begin shortly. And suddenly, the computer shuts down the facility and locks all the adults in the room. The whole facility starts to rumble. Everyone tries to escape the facility as the director suddenly gets off of her chair and tries to make a run for it, but quickly gets crushed. The kids around band together and make a run for the outside, seeing a whole world that they've never seen before, realizing the outside is safe, and still thinking that this is all a test. They decide to split into two groups. Mihime and Shiro are sent back inside of the facility to gather the rest of the kids and tell them about the outside world. Meanwhile though, Glasses Guy checks on Tokyo's twin children, but just then realizes that he now can't differentiate which baby is which. He then draws a circle on one of the babies to try and tell the difference. Ayushima then meets up with him with the rest of the surviving scientists here and think the babies should be handed back to Tokyo. With the facility now destroyed and them have nothing left, she decides to execute the NOAA project, a top secret plan on how to safeguard the children of the academy for the future apocalypse. But she doesn't reveal her plans to them just yet. Back to Kiruko and Maru, they spot some lights in the distance of the Ibaraki facility and eventually reach the town nearby. Switching some of their money over to the local currency here, Kiruko finds out from this building worker that he recognizes her old friend Robin, that he actually works here as the town's doctor. Excited, she quickly finds him and the two reunite. She tells him her whole confusing body swap backstory and the name of her doctor who performed the surgery on her. He tells her that the doctor who did it was named Sakota, who is apparently the best of the best, but he lost contact with him some time back and since then he's been working on this town trying to grow it. He then says that she should take a totally relaxing, not suspicious bath and relax and they should talk later. Kiriko then washes up but finds that her clothes have been swapped out with fresh ones and they were waiting for her in her room. Robin then slithers in and tries to make small talk and springs like a rabid spider monkey. Kiriko freaks out not knowing who she really is anymore. Later, Mara swings by to visit Kiriko but finds her handcuffed to the bed and totally devastated. Realizing who did this, he finds Robin and beats the shit out of him, taking him to the ground with no emotion. Kiriko runs out and tells him to stop. He then tells her that he likes Kiriko for who she is as a person and accepts his fate in the friend zone forever. The two then prepare to continue their search for the Takahara Academy and Maru's final objective. Now let's head back inside to the surviving scientists, where they try to hand the babies back to Tokyo, but suddenly the director runs in and she's alive, and she tries to take away Tokyo's baby.
babies. But suddenly, she activates some unknown power within her and begins morphing into this monster, encasing her body and her child right as the director tries to grab the baby, getting trapped in Tokyo's transformation herself. Later, everyone from Takahara Academy finally links back up, and Shiro finally mans up and confesses his love to Mihime, and he gives her a pin from Takahara Academy to remind her of him. The kids then get onto a boat and escape the jungle as they arrive at this unknown city in the distance 24 years before the apocalypse begins. Man, if you don't want to go through no apocalypse in 24 years with worms and freaking Kyoko laser beam guns and like, comment, let us know what you liked. Of course, if you didn't like, don't forget to check out the How To Be playlist down below.